Director Emeritus from Sacramento City College, where she taught uh, the field ecology uh, certificate in the field ecology certificate program, field botany, advanced field botany. Uh, she holds a PhD in ecology from UC Davis. Uh, she's lived in the El Dorado foothills for uh, many decades and enjoys exploring the natural areas of the Sierra Nevada. Uh, she's very active in the El Dorado chapter of, uh, of CNPS. Uh, she's the field trip chair, as well as the co-chair of the Invasive Plans Committee and leads a a number of chapter research projects with the Pine Hill Preserve, some of which uh, she may discuss uh, this evening. So uh, I'd like to turn it over to you, Gina. Well, great. It's great to see everyone. Great to meet every everyone uh, from the Marin. Marin is a, a wonderful place to visit. I, I do it as often as I can, which is not often enough. So I will share my screen here so we can start talking about my favorite hikers. <laughs> okay, yeah, this is my granddaughter. This title is just to, is my chance to show off my beautiful granddaughter. And here we are visiting one of my favorite places where I don't really hike, but I sure visit a lot. And it is a vernal pool preserve um, near Sacramento. I'll talk about. So wait, what? I was supposed to talk about hikes. So that, I guess that's what I'll do. Um, I had a lot of problems uh, deciding what to talk about because there are so many places that I love to visit, that I love to hike, that I love to botanize. So it was um, a difficult uh, decision. But uh, for the first couple of places that I'm going to be talking about, it was not difficult, but I have to talk about these. And one is vernal pools. Um, I did study vernal pools for my uh, doctoral research at UC Davis. Uh, but even before that, I had become uh, enamored of vernal pools, which I know um, you are familiar with, that um, they are very special little seasonal wetland habitats or ephemeral wetlands, if you will, uh, that have um, standing water um, in the wintertime and are bone dry in the summer. But in between winter and summer is where we have our peak blooming period. Uh, so um, the reason I love vernal pools so much is that you have an incredible diversity of flora uh, within a very small area. So here we have um, a number of species just within a square foot, um, and they're and they're so wonderful. They um, uh, these are the what we call the peak bloomers. So after the water dries out. Um, these guys go ahead and bloom and set seed. Almost all of them are annuals, although this coyote thistle here is, is not an annual. It's one of the few perennials. The other thing I love about vernal pools is that they don't have, at least they don't have any dominant um, uh, non-native plants. Um, almost all of them are native plants that do well in vernal pools. Another thing they don't have that is a native that I actually appreciate they don't have is, is uh, poison oak. There's no poison oak in the vernal pools. Great thing about them. So um, they also, in addition to the wonderful flora, they, of course there's a uh, um, terrific fauna as well, but they tend to be small little critters. Um, and um, like this fairy moth down here, Adela, uh, which is uh, gathering pollen um, from uh, a checker bloom, Sedalsia calicosa, which is a little annual, um, Sedalsia, little annual checker bloom. Um, but it uses other vernal pool plants as a host plant. So where can you see vernal pools? Well, there are a number of places to see them throughout California, but I am most familiar with those that are in the Great Valley. Um, so um, that's where I've spent a lot of my time. And so this is the Illa M. Collin Conservation Preserve. Um, this is Rancho Cordova, which is, um, uh, it is an incorporated city that is just, um, just east of Sacramento itself. Um, this is free, um, open. I can go there anytime to visit. It's, um, so we've had a number of field trips here from the El Dorado chapter uh, to explore, especially the floral diversity of the vernal pools. 
Um, you might have learned that quite often vernal pools um, end up having uh, um, zones of different types of plants that end up forming little rings. This happens sometimes, but it doesn't always happen. And that kind of depends on if there is a diversity of elevations in the pool, if it's relatively flat, um, then you'll have less of that little ring effect. But we see a little bit of that ring effect here with the tidy tips um, on the edge and then um, um, a less thinia, a less thinia fremontii, uh, more in the bottom of the pool along with a white-headed navaricia. So um, there are lots of places to visit vernal pools. Um, one of my favorites that you probably are quite familiar with, Carrizo Plain, if you haven't been there, it's one of the most marvelous places in the world. This photo was taken during one of those super blooms you hear about. Um, and these are alkaline vernal pools. Whereas the vernal pools I was talking about at the Mather, at um, the Illa M. Collin Preserve, those are hard pan vernal pools. The water restricting layer underneath the, uh, the soil of the vernal pool is a, um, a mineral hard pan. Whereas at the Carrizo Plain, there is a, a, a clay plan. Um, at Howard Ranch, this is at the Casandes River Preserve. Um, and by the way, the, yeah, this, um, this uh, presentation is being recorded, as you probably realize. So all of this information will be on those slides, so you don't have to hurriedly <laughs> uh, write these down. Um, but the Howard Ranch is actually a part of the Cosumnes River Preserve, which is south of Sacramento. Um, it's a um, uh, was begun by the Nature Conservancy, but is a collaborative effort among a number of different agencies. Um, and one of the sections of the Cosumnes River Preserve is Howard Ranch that hosts um, wonderful of vernal pools. And there is a trail that runs through there from Rancho Seco Park. So it's actually easy to get to. And um, during the spring months, there are often uh, docent led tours on the weekends. Um, so uh, North Table Mountain, this is uh, an ecological reserve of the California Fish and Wildlife. And it is north of Oroville. Uh, this is also one of my favorite places, not only for the vernal pools that are there, but for the upland plants as well. Um, it's a place where you see just acres and acres and acres and acres of flowers in the early spring. Uh, probably late March and into early um, April is um, peak time to visit, uh, but it's really nice all the way through May. Um, and this one, instead of having a clay pan or hard pan, um, water restricting area or horizon in the soil. Instead, there is bedrock and in this case, basalt. Um, so uh, is it, you see some uh, different plants there, uh, but um, wonderful place to visit. One that's a little pro probably the closest to you is Jepson Prairie. Um, and this is near the town of Dixon, is south of Dixon on Highway 113 that you can access from Highway 80, so it's south of Highway 80. Um, and this is a clay pan vernal pool. So they have um, also some alkaline minerals. And so you see some different species than you would see in hard pan vernal pools. Um, however, one of the things about vernal pools is that you can see the same genera from vernal pool to vernal pool and from region to region or type of vernal pool to vernal pool, um, but there'll be different species of the same genus especially things like lasthenia, uh, goldfields, and down inches, for example. Um, so um, that's another thing that I really like about vernal pools. I will recognize the genus. I may, I don't know if I'm sure about this species, but I sure know that genus. Um, and so it becomes really interesting. So the next place I want to talk about, uh, or the next ecosystem, if you will, that I'd like to talk about where we um, like to hike, oops, um, is Pine Hill Preserve. Uh, Pine Hill Preserve um, uh, um, is a special preserve that has a collaboration amongst a number of agencies and our chapter as well, and other nonprofits like the American River Conservancy um, that was established in order to uh, provide habitat for um, eight plus rare uh, plant species. 
So um, what we're seeing here is you're on the top of Pine Hill looking west. So that lake you're seeing is Folsom Lake. Um, and so if you are in this spot that we're looking west here, if you look, if you look to your left, you'd see Diablo and to your right, you would see the Sutter Buttes. And then you just make a, a 180 degree turn, turn around and you're going to see the crystal range of the Sierra Nevada. Um, this hill is actually easy to see from Highway 50 as you're traveling up to Lake Tahoe and you start going up the hill, you'll see this hill because it has an old fire lookout on the top and a whole bunch of those dang communi uh, the communications towers. So um, this was established in uh, 2001 in order to um, provide habitat for um, eight plus rare species of plants. And um, what it's all about is some uh, rather um, uh, different types of soil. Um, Gabbro is an, an ignorous, uh, ignorous, <laughs> an igneous intrusive rock um, that um, has lots and lots of iron in it. So when it's oxidized, it turns a nice red. And so the soil that's derived from it is a nice red because of all the iron. Um, and um, it has some affinity to serpentine derived soils um, in that it has a relatively high magnesium to calcium ratio. Um, the soil is not as um, challenging as a serpentine derived soil, but it um, because it's thin, uh, because it's very rocky and the soil that's derived is high in clay, um, that can exclude uh, a number of plants that are not well adapted to um, this kind of soil um, and this kind of um, environment. Um, one of the things about this preserve, though, is that this, what we call this island of Gabbro soil, um, of about 120 square kilometers, all within El Dorado County, we have 750 plant species that have been counted there. So it makes this a, bio, a biodiversity hotspot within the biodiversity hotspot that California is anyway. So it's a wonderful place to, to visit and to hike. So there are a number of different units of the Pine Hill Preserve. And, um, and so um, all of these different units together make up the preserve, but um, they are disjunct. Um, and that is because of the um, limitations that we have in, its, in establishing um, these different areas as uh, part of the preserve. A lot of this has already been developed, as you can imagine. So um, uh, we have different parts of the preserve. Okay, so um, I'll start at the north end of, of the preserve. Uh, one of those units is called the Kanaka Valley. Um, and um, we normally start docent led hikes. Um, the, uh, El Dorado chapter of CNPS is responsible for organizing and carrying out um, the docent led hikes and the, at uh, Pine Hill Preserve. The preserve itself is for the most part managed by the Bureau of Land Management through their Folsom office. Um, so we normally start our hikes every spring in early April um, with a bird hike with Chris Kennard, who is an incredible birder but who is also an incredible naturalist. And uh, he knows as much about plants or more than I do. Uh, so he is a, a wonderful resource and he's very, very, uh, he very much enjoys sharing his knowledge with other folks. Um, so last year um, in 2021, there was about a five acre burn within the Kanaka Valley unit of the preserve. And um, so this spring then we were able to see the plant response to those fires. And one of the big responders was good old fairy lanterns, Calicordus albus, all these little white flowers, all that is Calicordus albus. Um, and what we've noticed um, in burns of the Pine Hill Preserve is that those geophytes just come right up after the fire. Those that have corms, bulbs, uh, rhizomes under the ground. Uh, they just uh, take off after a, after a fire, after a burn. 
Uh, this is one of the rare plants that we are providing habitat for with Pine Hill Preserve. This is Stebbins Morning Glory. That's an interesting morning glory. These are the little leaves. You see how skinny their little lobes are? <laughs> Linear lobes. Um, and so um, this is um, confined to um, the Pine Hill Preserve area, um, to El Dorado County, and another spot up in, um, up in uh, Nevada County. So, at the top of what we call Morning Glory Hill, named after the Stebbins Morning Glory. Um, of course, in the Ledyard Stebbins is the, uh, uh, the, the person that our Stebbins Morning Glory is named after. Um, so you can see some of the gabbro rock here. So where it's dark, not oxidized, where it has turned red, that's been oxidized. Lots of feldspar in there. Uh, so what we're seeing here is we're looking west and we're seeing a, a, a leg or, or an inlet of the Folsom Lake here, some gorgeous views. And over here on this view, we actually see another burn that happened and this in 2021, and this was over in the Folsom Lake uh, recreation area. So that's state, that's uh, state parks land over there. And we're seeing some similar responses of plants over there uh, to that burn. Uh, more views from um, the top of Morning Glory Hill. Um, this is Alice um, Cantalo. She is our chapter president and his, her husband, Lester Lubikin, who is on our conservation committee. Um, and um, so there are also cool plants that aren't part of the rare plant suite that I love. Right at the top of Pine Hill, between those gabbro rocks, we have the narrow leaf lotus. And I think I like the fruits better than the flowers. I mean, I'm not supposed to, am I? But I do, I really love those fruits. Down in the Cameron Park unit um, of the uh, Pine Hill Preserve, um, we um, start those hikes a little bit later in April. And here is Deb Ayers. Uh, she is the other co-chair of our, what we call the weed committee or the invasive species committee. And she is leading a hike here in the uh, Cameron Park unit. Um, so um, the Pine Hill Preserve has several different types of, of habitats, uh, but one of course is um, foothill chaparral uh, with lots of, of ceanothus and, and manzanita and chamise and all those wonderful um, shrubs. Um, and then you see a, a California black oak in the background here. So oak woodland is also another type of habitat that we have in the preserve. And this is Pine Hill Ceanothus. This, uh, this is a Ceanothus that only exists in that 120 square mile, or excuse me, square kilometer um, area that we described as that um, Gabro soil island. Um, and this is a, a pretty much a prostrate little Ceanothus um, that blooms very early in the spring, as early as, um, as uh, February. So if you wanna see this in bloom, you have to get out early. Um, and so here's a view from the Cameron Park unit. There's another hill there that we climbed to the top of, and you can see all this chaparral and gray pine here. Um, and of course the, um, the Yerba Santa, uh, we also have leather oak there. Uh, leather oak is a plant that is um, endemic to both serpentine and gabbro soils and doesn't really grow anywhere else. Here's another one of our rare plants, another one of our listed plants, and this is uh, Red Hill soap root. Um, it's similar to our common soap root, except that the flowers are larger, hence grandiflorum, but its flowering stem is shorter. So the flowering stem generally is less than two feet tall, whereas you know in, in the common soap root, it gets way, 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 way tall. Um, we have a sneaking suspicion that these two species hybridize because we can see some things we're going, eh, which one is it? <laughs> um, so we have a sneaking suspicion there's some hybridization going on there. Um, so uh, red Hill soap root exists um, of course, on the Pine Hill Preserve in El Dorado County, but it is also found on serpentine soils, such as down at the Red Hills, which is um, a BLM 
um, preserve that is south of Sonora. So our quintessential uh, mascot, if you will, for the Pine Hill Preserve is the Pine Hill Final Bush is uh, probably the rarest of our rare species. Um, and it um, exists only um, on Pine Hill itself, the actual hill, which um, is a California Fish and Wildlife um, ecological reserve. Um, and so um, the Pine Hill flannel bush exists only on that one hill and one adjacent hill. So uh, just in two places, um, if you counted up each individual, there would be fewer than 500 individuals. This is a low growing shrub in general. Sometimes in the shade, it gets taller. So if it's shaded, it, it can grow quite taller, but generally is decumbent, hence its name. Um, and it's different from the California flannel bush in having these really dark copper and sometimes absolutely red flowers rather than having yellow flowers. Um, and it's decumbent nature. So um, Pine Hill Preserve um, uh, or Pine Hill Ecological Reserve on Pine Hill itself, around the perimeter of Pine Hill itself are a number of homes and uh, you know, private places uh, that uh, uh, people live. And so California Fish and Wildlife determined that it would be a good idea to put in a fire break around the base of the um, uh, Pine Hill. And so what they did is they worked together with Cal Fire and um, some crews to uh, clear out the brush. But prior to clearing out the brush, our chapter was enlisted in marking the rare plants. So um, I was not involved in that effort. <laughs> But it was quite an amazing effort because people had to slog through thick chaparral um, to mark the rare plants with flagging, <laughs> uh, which they did. Um, then what happened was that the crews, what they did is they cleared the shrubs and put the um, material of the shrubs in piles. So they piled up what they had cut and then they burned them in piles. Um, so Subsequent to that, both the California Fish and Wildlife and together with our chapter, initiated a study to look at how plants and animals responded to that fire break, um, uh, the fuel break, the clearing and the burn piles within the, that fuel break. Um, and if you want to know about the results of that study, <laughs> What you need to do is go to the conference down in San Jose in October, because we will be giving a, a talk about um, the response of both the plants and the animals um, to that fuel break. So come to the conference. You're going to find lots of um, interesting things to hear about. So here's another view of that quintessential um, Pine Hill uh, flannel bush on one of our docent led hikes. Another view, and here's that old fire lookout here. Here's one of the communications towers also, and the typical chaparral, and this plant with all the orange flowers on it. That's another Pine Hill flannel bush. Um, but this is um, at one of our rare species that only grows um, um, in that, uh, that Gabro soil island. And this is the El Dorado bed straw. Um, and it's a tiny little thing. It's, it only gets to be about yay tall. It's a tiny little, tiny little guy. And you can see where it grows. See, these are California black oak leaves. It likes to be in the shade of California black oaks. So when I'm in this Gabbro Island, as it were, and I find um, California black oaks, I start looking down and looking for the El Dorado bed straw. And doing that, I found some right across the street from me, which is part of the Cameron Park unit of the preserve. <laughs> so again, this is Deb Ayers, and she and I are working with a UC professor, UC Davis professor Dan Potter, on a genetic study of the Pine Hill flannel bush. Um, so um, we're looking at the genetics um, of the of the flannel bushes, the Pine Hill flannel bushes that occur on Pine Hill. 
uh, with some flannel bushes that are found up in Nevada County and in Butte County um, uh, that appear to be very similar, but have some differences. And so we're wondering about the genetic history of those plants. Um, and so uh, we're doing genetic studies and um, hopefully we're going to have some answers here um, in the next couple of years about um, these um, different kinds of flannel bushes that we find north of us. So here um, is the page from the Pine Hill Preserve website, which is pinehillpreserve.org. And um, we'll start to, um, to schedule the 2023 hikes at the beginning of the year, January or so. So if you wanna go on one of those hikes, what you need to, they're very popular. So you have to sign up early and there are links to, um, there are links in order to sign up um, on both the Pine Hill Preserve website and our chapter website, eldoradocnps.org. Uh, so sign up early and come on over and stay over a night and enjoy um, our Pine Hill Preserve. So um, now I'm gonna to turn to some of my favorite hikes that aren't, uh, aren't near and dear to my heart because they're really close and because I study them, but because I just love them for their flora and for their diversity and for their animals and the scenic beauty. Um, so one place um, in the Sierra the foothills to visit is definitely the Auburn State Recreation Area. There are four gazillion million miles of trails um, in the Auburn State Recreation Area. Um, where we are here is very near to the confluence of the Middle and North Fork of the American River. Um, and if you've ever been there, this is right off um, uh, 49 south of Auburn. Uh, there is a bridge that goes over the American River right near that confluence. And this um, trail takes off to the east of there. Uh, it's called the Quarry Trail because there's an old limestone quarry there. And the trail is actually a, a road. It was a road that has become a trail. And before it was a road, it was the railroad bed for carrying limestone out of the canyon. So it's really pretty fascinating history. Um, but it, there are so many things to love about uh, this. This is my this is one of my favorite hikers. I have to say, is my favorite hiker. This is my husband. <laughs> so uh, uh, have to include him. So there. I don't know about you, but I am enamored with rock walls and the diversity of flora on rock walls. And the quarry trail is full, just chock a block. Uh, with rock walls, uh, with um, a variety of, of, of annuals and perennials and mosses and lichens and wh um, whatever is your pleasure. Uh, what we have up here that's yellow, that's sedum spathulifolium. So some lovely succulents there. Uh, and so um, these rock walls are part of, the, of what I really love about this trail, the quarry trail. Um, the shrubs there are incredible, lovely shrubs. So one of them, of course, you probably love this one too, large flowered bush monkey flower, which now is Diplacus grandiflorus. Uh, Diplacus, I think that, I don't like that name, but it's not my call. <laughs> uh, um, it is a gorgeous bush. And then we also have vines like the pipe vine. And we have, of course, the swallowtail caterpillars that use the pipe vine as a host plant. But one of my favorites that we have so much along the quarry trail, um, the quarry trail has a north facing slope with all these wonderful plants on it, um, is snowdrop bush. Oh gosh, it's just, just gorgeous in the spring. Um, probably late April, early May is the best time to see this one. Has a gorgeous scent. Um, the flower is just gorgeous. So a wonderful, wonderful plant. So um, there's lots of other shrubs too. And oh, I should mention, I don't have a photo, but I've got to mention that on that trail, there are seven different species of oaks, seven different species, two of them shrubs. So we have shrub or scrub um, oak, the uh, Quercus berberifolia, and we also have um, the shrub form of Oregon white oak. Uh, um, so it, it's, um, 
uh, a great place to see oaks, which is one of the reasons I like this trail in the fall. So if you are of a mind to come over our way, stay over in Auburn and do some trail hiking, um, October is a great place to, uh, a great time to visit the quarry trail um, and to see the acorns of all the different oaks. So, <laughs> and um, the fruits of other plants. So um, it's, it's really a great time. But this is Auburn State Recreation Area, guys. Look, look at all the trails there. It's um, um, amazing. One thing that I do have to mention though is the current mosquito fire that's burning. Um, it is, uh, has actually burned parts of um, the Auburn State Recreation Area. It's a little bit further to the east, but coming ahead, come this way, like as of uh, oh, uh, Saturday. It looks like it's going to be moving in the other direction from here on with the wind changes, um, but this is something to think about. Um, so, um, so here's the website. Um, I highly recommend this, this recreation area. So I'm gonna go a little bit north now um, up into uh, the South Yuba River State Park. Um, there are a number of trails and a number of units of the state park of South Yuba. not all together, there are different units. Um, and one of my favorite hikes um, for the South Yuba State Park um, is Independence Trail. Now, unfortunately, last year there was a fire that affected the western portion of this trail and burned this flume and also a ramp down to a creek. Uh, so that part of the, uh, of the trail is closed, but the trail that goes to the east of the trailhead and down toward the river um, is uh, open. Now, the best thing about this trail is that it is made from the, an old diversion canal from the Yuba River. And so um, it is, it's, it's almost completely flat, very, very, very uh, shallow grade on it. And the thing I like best about it is, well, it is accessible. You know, it's an accessible trail, that's cool. The other thing is, well, it's easy. <laughs> the other thing is, look at this, you've got these slopes and you're down, you're walking in the old canal. So if you wanna take a picture of a flower or a plant, you don't have to bend over. There's no kneeling down or all of that stuff. It's just, and there's so much there. There's delphiniums, there's you know, larkspurs, there's ginger, there's um, all kinds of different members of the Brodea family. There's, oh, geez, so much. So this is a, a view of some of my favorite hikers uh, from our chapter that we went uh, to the Independence Trail um, four years ago. And we had a great time there. So um, the, um, on the south of the trail is a north facing slope. And so we have things like big leaf maple and canyon oak and whatnot. And in that understory there, we have lovely herbaceous plants like Pacific sunflower. And by the way, it is now in Lysimachia, as is scarlet pimpernel, by the way. Okay, get, get used to that, all these Lysimachias now. <laughs> um, and of course, lots and lots of this big leaf maple, which I, I find is just beautiful. And those Hartwig's ginger, and Calicordus monophilus. And by the way, there's also Calicordus albus here and those two hybridize. And makes a very interesting hybrid where you get a kind of leaning flower that is very pale yellow. It's really cool. And we find them usually with the, um, the yellow star tulip. So we have a feeling that the yellow star tulip is the maternal parent. So. Um, interesting there. Of course, there are animals to see there. We have our alligator lizard, and here is a tiger moth that was laying these little pearl eggs on a deer brush leaf. <laughs> and I found this on a rock and I went, whoa, this is just too cool. But I have to, um, um, I have to mention though, is that uh, there's lots of mosquitoes there in the spring. 
Lots of mosquitoes. Oh, and ticks. I went home with three of them on my last hike there. So you really need your insect repellent and to protect yourself uh, 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 from bites from those, those critters. Um, by the way, uh, um, this is near Placer County. This is in Nevada County, but uh, it's near Placer County and Placer County is a hot spot for Lyme disease. So, <clears throat> all right, be careful. Don't get yourself bit by a tick. Um, so I mentioned that there's a lot of members of the Brodea family along this trail, including one of my very favorites, the uh, Twining Brodea or Snake Lily. This one, literally, I didn't do this. It did it itself. It tied itself in a knot. It is so incredible. <laughs> I love this. And this is a creek that's along the trail with a nice little waterfall. So um, as I mentioned, South Yuba State Park has several units. The westernmost unit is this Bridgeport crossing. That's, you've probably heard about the longest um, covered bridge and they have just finished restoring it. So it's well uh, worth, your um, worth your while to go visit this westernmost uh, section of the South Yuba River State Park. And there is this great point defiance trail um, that is a loop trail. And man, it's, it's, that's a hike. Now that is a hike. My husband and I did it and it, it's a hike. So take lots of water and give yourself lots of time. <laughs> Uh, but uh, so many wonderful uh, plants, flowers, uh, shrubs, trees along that trail. Um, and so then there are other units to the east of that main unit. Um, so where we were in Independence Trail is in this middle section along Highway 49, uh, north of um, Nevada City. Um, but all of these have trails. So wonderful places to visit uh, foothill flora. So another place that I want to mention uh, our way is the Traverse Creek Botanical Special Interest Area, um, which is in the El Dorado National Forest. Um, and this is a special place because this is where you find um, outcrops of serpentine. So you will see some serpentine endemics and some a couple of species of rare plants. Um, it is, is very gorgeous again in the spring, um, probably April, May is the best time to visit this place. It's south of Georgetown. It's just a, like three miles south of Georgetown. So it's real easy to find. Um, and oh, by the way, Georgetown has been evacuated because of the mosquito fire. Um, but um, it looks like Georgetown is gonna be okay. And it looks like they've been evacuated, but it looks like they're gonna be okay. Um, so this is my colleague and, and friend, Lisa Serafini, who taught, uh, or and actually still teaches at Sacramento City College. And here we are um, with our students taking a look at the flora of this serpentine outcrop. But what I like about this photo is to just contrast what you see on the serpentine outcrop with what you see on deeper forest soils, just you know, within feet of each other. This is how much soils make a difference. It is uh, just incredible um, what is, uh, the um, edaphic differences that there are. On your way up to Traverse Crease on Highway 193, north of Placerville, you can come across a slope that has a bush poppy on it. There's a place to stop, but you gotta be really quick and you gotta be, eh, you gotta, there's not a whole lot of room, but you gotta just kind of scoot over there um, and stop and take a look at this lovely bush poppy. Um, on that slope, there's more bush poppy, but it's way above the highway and there's no place to stop to crawl up to it. <laughs> but this spot is, you know, if you know where it is, you get, yeah, you get bush over and you can take a look at the bush poppy and our woolly paintbrush, which is a, um, a common paintbrush um, uh, in, in our chaparral communities up here in the foothills. Um, and it's called woolly sunflower because the uh, or paintbrush because of the um, because of the the soft hairs that are all over the uh, the er the um, the um, herbage. Um, there's cute little plants there, of course, um, that bloom in the springtime, including blue cup. It's so adorable. Look at that growing right out of the serpentine rock. 
Now that's adaptation. Whoa, you try it. <laughs> and then Goldfield's Lasthenia. I'm not sure which species of Lasthenia this is, but I have a feeling it's Lasthenia gracilis, our common Goldfields. Uh, as you probably know, um, Lasthenia gracilis, the, our common Goldfields, is uh, difficult to distinguish from California. Uh, California um, Goldfields. <laughs> they have some minute differences. You can also see Live Forever at Traverse Creek. Um, oh, by the way, you can see Live Forever at the North Table Mountain um, uh, Reserve as well. And so this will grow in the serpentine outcrop. And then in, on the forest soils, we have our narrow leaf trillium, which is or a narrow petal, not narrow leaf, narrow, narrow petal uh, with those lovely dark, dark, dark purple petals. Of course, there are animals there too. You always have to put in a shout out to the animals. And here's a Hutton's Vireo that was nesting in leather oak. So as I mentioned, leather oak is scrub oak that is endemic to both serpentine and gabbro soil. So we have it at, at Pine Hill as well. Um, and it doesn't grow on deeper, more, um, deeper, more um, uh, nutritious soils, so uh, more forgiving soils. Um, and we think the reason is, is because it's so slow growing that it doesn't compete well uh, with other plants that grow in those deeper soils. Okay, I have to mention another state park that I absolutely adore. And that's Calaveras Big Tree State Park. So if you've never been there, you have to go. This is off Highway 4, just east of Arnold. Okay, so Highway 4, um, um, east of Arnold, which is also east of Murphy's. Um, so if you end up in Murphy's to, you know, do some wine tasting, just, you know, forget the wine. Go further up the highway and take a right turn and visit Calaveras Big Tree State Park. What we're seeing here is what's called the discovery stump. This is what remains of the first um, giant quail that was seen in this area. And it was subsequently, uh, almost immediately cut down um, and the bark removed so that it could be kind of reconstructed with bark and go on a tour, but you know, it got burned. And so that was that. Um, this was back in the mid 1800s. Um, uh, for a while, this stump was a, a dance floor. So they danced on this thing. And the log uh, that's just downhill from this uh, stump uh, was once used as a bowling alley. Today, it's part of the North Grove Trail and part of the story of the history of um, the um, state park. But of course, you can see those wonderful mature uh, big trees that they giant sequoias, um, and they are just incredible. Uh, the North Grove Trail is really short. It's only about a mile and a half long. Um, it's all completely flat, but you're gonna take a long time to do it because there's so much to see, um, including things like our lovely snow plant in the very early spring. In the fall, I just love this place in the fall, mostly because of the color, the fall colors. Our mountain dogwood is just incredible in the North Grove Trail um, in the fall. So we went um, late October, early November, a couple of years in a row, just beautiful. And a lovely contrast with that fire resistant bark of the giant sequoia. So here's my husband admiring this fallen giant more fall views of the North Grove Trail, just gorgeous. But that's not all that's there at the Calaveras Big Tree State Park. If you head south toward the Stanislaw River, um, you can come to the Lava Bluffs Trail. So at Lava Bluffs, we have um, basically mud soils there. And so you can see what kind of, you know, like lava cap type soils. Oh. Um, so you have different plants, especially in the springtime, a lovely creek. Um, and this is a seeping rock wall with Dudleya cymosa growing from it. Just, just really gorgeous. Uh, here is the uh, map for Calaveras Big Tree State Park. 
down at the very southern end, down near the Stanislaw River, there is another trail called the Salt Grove Trail, which is another grove of giant sequoias. Um, and so uh, this one I like because there's fewer people, it's less developed, um, so, um, so not as much distraction, it's a little bit more natural. And so that's a lovely trail as well. And, that, and that's, a, that's a decent hike. Oh, and the Lava Bus Trail, that's a hike. There's up and down and rock scrabbling and all that good stuff. So that's a hike. If you want to hike, that's a good hike. I also have to mention high country and this mid Sierra. Uh, so um, like from Carson Pass. So if you've ever been up Highway 88, east of Jackson, all the way up to Carson Pass, there are trails that take off from Carson Pass, one to the north, and that's called the uh, Lake Meese. Um, trail and one to the south, which goes to Lake Winnemucca and beyond. You can actually hike up to the top of Round Top, which is this peak that's right here at the end of the Lake Winnemucca. But one of the great things that you see um, on this trail to Lake Winnemucca is you see white bark pine, Pinus albicollis, which does a wonderful job of crumholting, which is um, in German that means crooked tree. And so the wind and the snow and the, just the um, challenging environment, especially in the wind and in the winter, um, affects the stature of these plants. Um, this is called flagging. The wind is coming in this direction. And so all the branches end up going this way because all the ones that are on the other side of the tree get uh, pruned off by the wind. <laughs> so that's flagging. And this was all twisted. You can see it's all twisty up and that's the, the crumb holding. Um, white bark pine is part of the white, um, the white pine group of pines. Um, and it's like uh, sugar pine is affected by the white pine blister rust. Um, but the, if you go to this uh, trail in say uh, July probably is your best bet for the most diversity of uh, flowering plants, um, then you'll see um, a, a, a really huge variety of wildflowers. Um, here is the alpine gentian, which if you've never seen that, it is just so adorable. These lovely little fringy little um, appendages on the petals and the little green spots, they're just so cute, just adorable. And this is a is a polygonum, a knotweed. You know, you know, generally a knotweed, you go, a knotweed's a knotweed, you know, how, how pretty could it be? But this is a pretty knotweed, uh, knotweed. Uh, this is, and it's native. This is a native knotweed. Um, and it has these lovely, cute little white flowers. And look at the little red anthers. Aren't they adorable? Lots of times, the cutest part of a flower is the anther. I don't know if you've ever noticed that, but boy, I love anthers. <laughs> They're great. So here's, here's the classical shot. And I took this. I'm so proud of myself. <laughs> so this is a Clark's nutcracker. Clark's nutcrackers uh, feed on the seeds of pine, including the white bark pine. And what they do, um, which is similar to what scrub jays do and sellers jays do, right? Um, they cache um, seeds and nuts um, in the ground uh, to store for later consumption, but they don't always retrieve all of those seeds. And so those seeds are effectively planted. And so there's a nice symbiotic relationship between white bark pine and Clark's nutcracker, which is a cool thing. So um, there's another way to get up to Wait Linamaka, and that's from Woods Lake, which is a little bit further west down Highway 88, down toward Capels Lake. Um, and you can see uh, Grand Juniper, which is our Sierra Juniper, um, uh, on that part of the trail, as well as more white bark pine. Here you can see one that has succumbed perhaps to the white pine blister rust. It's sad to see. Um, another thing we saw though is not, is not a plant and it's not an animal. And it's not a fungus either, by the way. This is dog vomit slime mold. Okay, if you haven't seen it, I have seen it at Muir Woods. So you go when it's wet, 
You might see some dog vomit slime mold in your woods. That's in your neck of the woods. Okay, so um, dog vomit slime mold is actually, it's a protist. The basic life form of a slime mold is an amoeba, believe it or not. And what happens is um, a, a couple of these amoebas coalesce and then uh, to form one cell. And that, that cell just continues to grow to form what we call the plasmodium. Eventually that plasmodium will start to dry out and the um, structure will form little stalks with spores. And that's why it was called a mold because it reproduces in a similar way. But what comes out of the spore is not a fungus. What comes out of the spore is an amoeba. Go figure, isn't that weird? And of course, some of our grass of Parnassus, uh, we found a wonderful showing of grass of Parnassus near Lake Winnemucca this year. Um, and it was in early August and it was really just gorgeous. Uh, we also went last year um, and so, ooh, guess what all that gray stuff is? Milk, you got it, you smoke. If you'll remember, we had a huge fire um, in El Dorado County called the Caldor Fire. Um, and um, there was also another fire that was uh, closer to this area called the Tamarack Fire. Um, and uh, both of them produced smoke that uh, made for smoke-filled days. We decided to go anyway, but my husband was really upset when I got back. He said, do you know what the AQI was up there when you were there? 600. What were you doing up there? Yeah, I guess we shouldn't have been. There are so many places to visit, but um, I have to put a shout out to our local um, land trusts, like the Sacramento Valley Conservancy that has the Dil Dil Deer Creek Hills in Slough House, which is um, kind of south and east of Sacramento itself, um, where there are some wonderful habitats um, and even flowers growing on old dredger tailings from the mining days. And so we had hikes here, docent led hikes. Our own Lisa Cooper, who was right here, um, led the hike. Uh, she is um, on the board of, um, of the Sacramento Valley Conservancy, as well as being a member of our CNPS chapter. Um, then if you go up Highway 50 and you're on your way to Lake Tahoe, a great place to visit is Bridalville Falls and Picnic Area. It's right off of Highway 50, right there. There, um, you just pull off into a parking area to see this lovely, um, this lovely waterfall called Bridalville Falls. And then you also, so we'll see on the rocks, more rock walls. If you love rock walls, this is a great place to stop. And you get to see a parasite. You get to see Aphelon purpureum, the naked broom ring, um, which is parasitizing the sedum spaculifolium there. Um, Caples Creek is another great place. It's within the El Dorado National Forest. Um, and uh, we visited this this year because this had been the center of a prescribed burn that happened several years before the Caldor fire. And as, I don't know if you, if you, last year you watched the progression of the Caldor fire, but what it did is, is it went around where that prescribed burn occurred. And so the, the forest um, uh, was pretty much untouched. And so we wanted to go to see how well it had fared through the Caldor fire, and we found that it had fared quite well where the prescribed burn occurred. So that was an encouraging thing. So Caples Creek actually um, does a confluence, has a confluence with the Silver Fork of the um, American River um, at near the trailhead of um, the Caples Creek Trail. And this is also a hike. If you want a good hike, you can go as far as you want. We go about five miles in and come back, but you can go all the way to Cables Lake if you like. And on the way, we'll pass a couple of wonderful mountain meadows. Um, these are the piles that were of uh, brush and um, branches that were um, raked and uh, cut 
in preparation for the prescribed burn. And so um, to, to take uh, material away from the mature trees. And that works. Those mature trees survive the prescribed fire um, in fine fashion. So I guess I have to go to a couple of places. Just for a couple of places. I have to uh, mention a place that my husband and I have visited so many times, but this early this year in February, we actually decided to walk the North Trail of Russian Gulch State Park, which is, um, Russian Gulch is between Mendocino and, um, and Fort Bragg on Highway 1. Gotta go, gorgeous, another gorgeous spot. So what we did is we took um, the North Trail here, like this way, and um, there's a place where the two, the Falls Loop Trail and the North Trail meet. We kept on going to the waterfall, which is gorgeous. Uh, right now, the Fern Canyon Trail is closed, but when we went, we came back by way of the Fern Canyon Trail, so uh, the Falls Loop Trail, and then went back this way. Um, really lovely. If you love ferns, this is a great place to go. Beautiful rock walls covered in ferns. A beautiful trail with, of course, the coast redwood, sequoia, some for Byron's, uh, Douglas fir, um, so Pseudosuga menzaceae. Um, here's a rock wall that had this lovely, the lovely um, five finger fern that everybody loves, as well as Western sword fern. Here's the falls themselves. There's a nice little bench here for you to take a rest and take photos and have lunch. Um, this is a hike. It's a good hike. Uh, it's, a, it's a very doable hike, but it is a hike. It'll take you some time. So give yourself at least half a day for that. In terms of flowers, we were there kind of early. We were in there in February, but we did find the leaves of the um, Vancouveria the inside out flower. We didn't see any flowers, but we saw these cool lacy leaves that had been bunched. And we did see one flower of redwood sorrel. <laughs> but uh, of course, uh, later in the spring, there would be more flowers to see. And I also have to, I know this is all very familiar to you. You have a lovely plant list for Chimney Rock and have uh, probably visited this many, many times. Um, I've been there maybe four times, but I, I just love this spot. Um, and here's our, our Northern elephant seal wieners that are on the beach uh, below the bluff that on the trail. And of course that lovely coastal prairie with the tidy tips is just so wonderful to see. Um, and I just, I don't know, the fog and then the flowers and uh, oh, it's just, uh, the diversity of flowers there in the in the spring and the early spring is just gorgeous. But you know, you can keep on going and different plants will flower later on. Uh, oh, probably this is one of your favorites too. The pink butter and eggs. Yeah, pink butter and eggs. Wow. Anyway, so this one um, has larger flowers and pink flowers compared to the uh, more common. Uh, yellow butter and eggs, uh, but um, you don't always get to see this. I see this on the coast and I just go, woo! Um, and of course, um, it's lovely that there is a Wildflowers of Chimney Rock poster at the beginning of the trailhead uh, for you to uh, get yourself familiar with what you might see and how special it is. I love the White's paintbrush, the Castilea Whitey Eye with, uh, in its uh, yellow form. And of course, the rare uh, Trifusaria floribunda, the uh, San Francisco owl's clover. Um, this thing is so tiny. I don't know if you've seen it yet. If you it go out next spring, if you haven't seen it yet, um, I found it out um, on the bluff there. And it's the the inflorescence about that big, and the individual flowers are tiny, like about this big. That is definitely a belly botany plant growing together with the California uh, gold fields there. And good old uh, narrow leaf mules here, uh, lovely. And the, the checker mallow, the lovely common checker mallow that we see on the coast, so pretty. I love the, the Malvaceae, the mallow family. 
And this guy, I was, I was down on my hands and knees and on my belly taking a photo of a flower. And then this guy just popped his head out of his hole. He went, whoop. And I went, hello. <laughs> and he went, went back down again. And then he came back up again. And he went down again. And he came back up again. So, uh, you know, they're probably still out there. Go out there and see if you, you just sit down, you know, sit down on the bluff. If you see some holes in the ground, that's probably at least weasel um, holes in the ground. And um, habitat there, homes. So have a little seat on the ground and you may be uh, uh, treated with a, a view of the least weasel. So adorable. <laughs> One more state park that I have to just mention. I know this is a long way away and I hope that you visited it. And if you haven't, I hope that you do. This is our largest state park in terms of area, in terms of land area. Anzabrago Desert State Park. It's east and over the hill from San Diego um, and south of Palm Springs. Easy to get to. Um, they did have some flooding this last week. They got, uh, they got some of that rain from uh, what was left of Hurricane K. Uh, but I, I think they'll be all fit. okay. They've had flooding there before. They've had flash floods a number of times before. Um, I love the slopes that are full of the California barrel cactus, agave, teddy bear choya, and also the herbaceous, uh, the smaller, more herbaceous plants like brown eyes, member of the evening primrose family, and the desert lily, uh, undulata, named for those undulating leaves. This thing is just incredibly gorgeous. Um, and then just you know, a diversity of different wildflowers that, that you can see there, including the sand herbina. Um, Umbelata, a different subspecies than we have out on the coast, but it is um, so lovely out there um, against the sand and against the, the dry hills. Um, there is a trail there. There's a lot of different trails, of course, at Anza Borrego Desert, but one of my favorites is the one called Blair Valley Trail, um, where of course you see a lot of the plants, but also you see Native American sites. You see sites with lots of bedrock mortars where um, food was processed. And you also see this work, which um, apparently was probably used uh, for ceremonial purposes for um, girls that were becoming women. Um, and these are called pictographs because these, rather than being um, carved into the rock, these are actually painted into the rock. So those are really interesting to see. If you continue down this trail, you come to an overlook um, into the valley beyond. So it's a, a, a lovely uh, view there as well. So that's the Blair Valley Trail and the Borrego Desert State Park. Um, also there, we saw this guy, a desert horned lizard. Uh, uh, that's my favorite lizard. I don't know about you guys, but these things are so wonderful. Yeah, they are just, I don't know. They're just really so special. Okay, this is not actually in the park itself. This is actually like, you can ignore those little, um, uh, 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 you know, sprinkler heads. <laughs> but look what these people did in their yard. They put in Ocotillo and a, bell, a barrel cactus and a puncha, you know, wow, good for them. Um, but I had to take a picture of this road runner that was running through there and has a lizard. And based on that, um, tail. I think it might be a whip tail. I don't know. I'm not sure. But I love road runners are just too cool. Well, in terms of resources of where to find places to go and hike, uh, national forest websites are wonderful because they have a certain section for recreation. And then you can pull down a menu and click on hiking. And then you can pull on hiking and go to day hikes. And um, so these are the national forests that are near me, but of course, throughout the state, we have many national forests with oh, so many uh, trails and places to hike and see a variety of habitats. Um, 
chapter websites like yours, for example, you have these wonderful plant lists of all these different places in Marin to go exploring. And I'm gonna check out those lists and I'm gonna check out more of your favorite places from your, from your website. Um, this is the El Dorado Chapters website, a map of different places um, that we recommend folks go. And then below this, um, this where it says plant walk descriptions, there are plant walk descriptions and plant lists for you to download now to carry with you on your trails. And there's a variety of different hikes. Here's Traverse Creek. Um, that's pretty easy. Um, and um, the Thunder Mountain, now that's, that's a challenging one. It, you go up a mountain and it's a very challenging. Um, but um, chapter websites often have great, um, uh, great suggestions of where to go. Um, one, I think underutilized resource are land trusts. Many land trusts have public assets, access lands with trails in them like the American River Conservancy that I mentioned, who they're centered in Coloma, California. Um, your local um, uh, land trust, I'm sure, have similar um, lands and public access, uh, like our Sacramento uh, Valley Conservancy, uh, Placer Land Trust, uh, which is centered in Auburn off of Highway 80, has a number of properties with trails and public access that are just just gorgeous, especially in the spring. Auburn is about at about 1500 feet in elevation. So um, the best time to visit is early in the spring. So April, May. Um, so state parks and reserves. So take a look at your list of state parks, uh, federal parks, forests, recreation areas, all those. And by, by the way, if you are old, Sorry, but if you're old, you can get that federal recreation lands pass. So you can use that at any uh, park uh, forest lands that are that are federal for day parking. Plus for camping, you get a discount. So it's well worth that 80 some bucks. I mean, you're gonna go through that and you know, it's gonna make it worthwhile very shortly. So that is, you know, one of the great assets of, of being old. Um, and if you haven't, you should get your golden poppy pass for your state parks. And that way you can park um, for day use in any state park or reserve. Um, and so that, um, that really helps. And we got ours um, in January and it, it paid for itself by the time April rolled around. So um, well worth it. And as I mentioned, land trusts and nonprofits, um, other nonprofits, and books, I mean, there are so many books, I, I can't mention them all, but one for the gold country is this one. I have it written here, so we don't have to write it down. Um, Wildflowered Walks and Roads of the Sierra Gold Country. And she has like abbreviated list. This is um, was produced um, some time ago. Um, so you have to crosswalk names. That's okay, you know how to do it. <laughs> and so, um, but this has a lot of suggestions. I'm still using this to go to new, to new trails that I haven't been in where I am and have been for more than 30 years. So this is great. If you're into Tahoe and environs around Tahoe, uh, so Julie Carville's book is just really wonderful. Gives you great ideas how to get there, um, what the hike is like. Is it, um, is it easy, moderate, or difficult? Um, gives you ideas, the plants that you'll see, fantastic. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Laird Blackwell's book, Wildflowers of California. Um, he starts off, um, his idea is, you know, you start at low elevation in the spring and you just move yourself up, you know? And then as, as, the, as the season progresses, you just move to higher elevation. <laughs> and so he has a number of places that he suggests you go and the plants that you, the special plants that you might see. And the Redbud chapter, I have to give them a hop, um, a shout out. They have wildflowers of the of Nevada and Placer counties. It's very similar to the flora of El Dorado County. So I use this quite a bit. They also have one on the shrubs and trees. 
So um, these are really helpful, but there are so many more. And of course, one of your best resources are your, are your uh, fellow plant explorers with, with places to go. So um, these are some of my favorite hikers. This is my husband, you recognize him. This is my daughter and uh, her uh, husband. And this is my favorite hiker. This is Amy, but she's 14 years old now. And so she hikes around the yard. <laughs> okay, so I'm If folks have questions. Gina, that that was that was wonderful. I mean, it's so much more than just a uh, a, a list of favorite hikes and geology and botany and rare plants and with with all that California has to offer, it's so valuable to have a curated list of uh, of hikes to put on a life list. And uh, that's a good idea, life list of 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 hikes. Yeah, that's a great. With idea. birds, we can do it. We, we can do it with hikes. That's so. right. That's a great idea. I love that, David. <laughs> so, so thanks so much. There are a few questions. Okay. Uh, great. Eva Buxton asks whether there has been a molecular analysis of Chlorogallum planiflorum and Pomeridianum. Um, you know, not that I know of. Um, I I think there should be, uh, just like we're doing with. Um, that's what we're doing with the Pine Hill flannel bush. Um, and um, so it's part of a larger study where uh, the California flannel bush and these uh, flannel bushes that we find in Nevada, um, Butte County, um, that are a little different. Um, so we're, we're doing that. That's getting done. But as terms of, of the soap roots, uh, not that I know of. But boy, if you know of a grad student that needs a project, that would be a good one. That would be terrific. Kathy King makes the comment that dogwood blooms white in the spring and looks like snow in Calaveras Big Trees State Park. Gorgeous comment. Yeah, oh yeah, it is. So you see those lovely white bracts in the spring. So, oh, I always tell people, if you have a mother <laughs> and you want to take her someplace special for Mother's Day, Calaveras Big Trees is a place to go because the dogwoods are in bloom. Yeah, it's it's really special. That's, I have, that's I, nice. I, I, I have a Natalii in my yard. And oh, you do! Lovely. It, it's with the drought; it's struggling. Uh, I bet. Yeah. Hope, it, it, hopefully, it will survive. It likes shade and moisture and all, all that good yeah. stuff. Yeah. So uh, I don't see any additional questions in the chat. So if anybody would like to ask a question, uh, feel free to unmute. Unmute. Raise your hand. Or... I have. I have. I have a question. The, uh, the the south side perimeter fuel break. I have to say it looked terrible. It 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 looked like somebody had almost come in with a dozer. It it just looked savage, and and so I'm I was delighted that they were preserving the rare plants and they cooperated with you. But it it looked like devastation. And I know that disturbance can often be creative. And I'm 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 going to look forward to your research. But <laughs> do you have a comment on the wisdom of that fuel break? Um, Most well, of the one it's you know it's tough. Um, it's very tough to balance um, safety um, for structures and human habitat and habitat for um, for plants. But um, I'll tell you that what they did, they did not use any kind of dozer or anything. It was totally all hand crews. And the hand crews went in and chopped is what they did. And they chopped relatively high so that plants like the, um, like the Pine Hill Ceanothus, the elder of uh, the Pine Hill Ceanothus, Roderick Ceanothus, um, it was all above that. Um, and so what we're seeing um, in response to the clearing and to the burn piles um, is that we're seeing you know, a resurgence of life. Um, and uh, for what we have been studying, the west area side of the perimeter and also the south side of the perimeter. And uh, we're looking at the, uh, where the burn piles were. So those we're calling those burn plots and adjacent plots that were cleared but not burned. 
And um, so what we're seeing is that we're getting seedling response from the Cianothus rodericii, the, the uh, um, Eldorado um, Cianothus, a uh, Pine Hill Cianothus, um, and also a lot of other plants that are not rare. So a huge uh, seedling response. We're also seeing in the cleared areas, we're seeing a response um, from other plants, including um, perennial plants that do re-sprout. And um, our manzanita, which is white leaf manzanita, uh, Arctostophilus visita, does not have a burl and does not sprout. So if there's a fire, it's killed, it's done. So it'll only come back um, through seeds. And we are seeing the white leaf manzanita come back. So we are now in like, um, in some of the areas that were uh, burned and cleared, we're five years out now. Um, and so from when they were actually burned and cleared and um, we're seeing um, a huge response there. Um, so um, uh, of course I have a lot of photos of that that I didn't have time to share tonight, but uh, um, we will be sharing that. And um, I, 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 I just, I don't think it, it's as horrid as it looks. <laughs> what, what, is, what, is, what is the next step then? Because I assume they're going to maintain it in some way. Yeah, and they will. They're going to have to maintain that in order to uh, prevent, um, uh, in order to, to prevent the, um, uh, the fires from, if something should happen on Pine Hill to reaching the, the surrounding structures. Um, so yes, they will have to maintain that. Because we, um, we know from the Southern California experience, if you burn or cut chaparral too frequently, and I'm talking about you know like 20 or 30 years, conversion. you yeah. get type conversion because it doesn't have a chance to uh, right. So to reproduce I, the seed. Right. So what we're hoping is that you know it will not be too frequent. Um, we are unfortunately seeing some incursion of some non-natives. Um, one that I'm especially, uh, probably the number one that I'm most worried about is one called false brome. Um, uh, Brachypodium dystachyon. Um, and um, this one has come in. Um, it seems to have stabilized as more of the native plants start to grow taller. And I think they're going to pretty much um, shade those out. I think that they'll be outcompeted eventually. Um, there was also a good response from the animals that you'll hear about from Mario Clip in our talk at the conference. Um, and uh, that, it was, that was interesting because, um, so the, the, the uh, small critters like the, the um, jackrabbits and the squirrels and those guys were utilizing that, preliminary, uh, that perimeter quite a bit because all this, all this new you know, herbaceous stuff for them to munch on and easier to get through. Well, if they're there, guess who else is there? The predators, right? So the predators have also come in, you know, like bobcat, fox, coyote, guess what? Mountain lion and bear. Yes, incredibly in this, this one hill that is completely surrounded by homes and ranches and all of that and roads and all of this stuff. I'm down there crouching and looking at the plants so that I can record, you know, the density of the seedlings and all of that. Deb and I are doing that. We're crouching down, and I'm thinking, "Whoa, <laughs> there are." We know of that there are two mountain lion at least there, and I'm going. I, now I, I know that I'm going. Oh boy. <laughs> I'm. I was just curious about the design, design because my understanding is that the the more recent designs leave islands intact in chaparral. They don't clear a cut. The islands are designed to be far enough away that the fire won't spread between them, but sufficient to maintain some intactness of, of, the, uh, of, of the existing environment. And it, it looked like that didn't play any part in, in the one that was created. Well, we didn't have island. Um, there are some areas that were not, uh, that were not cleared. Um, that, uh, but they're few and far between. It's it's pretty continuous. Yeah. It is pretty continuous. I, I just wonder if that would was done today. You could convince them to do a different design. I just yeah, I we, just raised that issue. Okay. Yeah, I, that's a that's a good question. It's a really good question. 
if that is going to be the, you know, what what is the plan going forward? Yeah, yeah. good. Uh, there's one more comment in the uh, chat from Cecilia Ronas saying all Auburn state recreation areas are now closed due to fire. So that's uh, apparently yeah, the, the that's latest all. word. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I, I'm not surprised um, at all. Um, and so, but here's the thing. Um, I think it would be, you know, next year, next spring um, in areas that are open. Um, you know, it'd be, it'd be definitely worth, worth visiting yeah. uh, right now, you know, it's not the best time to go anyway, geez, it, you know, up until last Friday, you know, like Friday. Yeah, no, and, it was god awful hot. <laughs> and there is one, one more question from Maribeth Graham. Um, uh, okay. Visited the Jepson Prairie Preserve this spring and found natives struggling to compete with invasive cranes built. Is anyone managing this infestation? Hmm. You know, um, cranes bill is everywhere. Cranes bill is just everywhere in grasslands. And uh, so um, it's, that would be a very, a big toughie. But um, one thing that, um, you know, fillories um, like cranes bill um, are good forage. And so one of the things that Jepson Prairie has done um, and I think is continuing to do, I haven't really checked this out recently, is to look at um, the um, help that, that sheep can provide. So uh, putting sheep in um, and sheep do graze pretty low. So um, they would feed on non-natives as well as natives. Um, and so um, have um, intermittent sheep grazing. Um, also they have looked at using fire so, um, and then combinations of sheep grazing and fire together. Um, and so um, I'm sure that this is a, an issue that they are um, aware of and are concerned about. Um, but um, at Jepson Prairie this year, I mean, because we had a, a pretty darn dry year and a lot of the pools at Jepson Prairie are very shallow pools then I'm not surprised that you would see uh, quite a bit of cranes bill in those shallow pools this last spring. If we, uh, and that will be an issue going forward uh, with the response of vernal pools to climate change. So I think the shallower vernal pools are gonna be struggling uh, because of that. Um, so I think probably one of the reasons you're seeing so much cranes bill this year is there, of course, there are more upland plant. And if the shallow pool didn't get much in the way of water, um, then it's not surprising to see a crane spill in, in the pool itself. Mm -hmm. Gina, again, thank you so much. It was wonderful talk. I'd like to let you know what's going to be next month on the second Monday, October 10th. Uh, okay. Frederic Lavapierre is going to talk about garden insects. And as a native oh, cool. gardener, I say that what I do, I'm gardening for insects. That's my goal was to get my plants eaten. That's right. And, and she's going to talk about the, the battle out there between those that eat and those that get eaten. So look forward, look forward to seeing you next month. Great. Thank you again for that coming. fun. Yeah. So thank you for inviting me. This was great. It was lots of fun. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.